Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Coach Josh. Hope you got a, guys are doing well on this Tuesday. I know the angle is a little different. I left my charger of my computer at home, so of course I'm on the phone. Uh, we're going to make sure that we pivot and do this well online. But for those who are joining me live here on YouTube, I think I got it on Facebook. I'm not sure. But for those who are joining me live for the very first time, my name is Josh Rezzi, also known as Coach Josh. And my goal is to help you make sense of your life and to help you grow holistically for God's optimal use. And after watching this video, like, man, I like this guy's vibe. Go ahead and subscribe because I would love to be your coach here online. But for those who've been rocking with me, whether it's been a, a, a whether you've been a subscriber for 14 years or 14 minutes, going to say thank you so much for trusting what God has entrusted to me. And I pray it continues to be treasured. But as everyone is joining me live, let me let you guys know about some things I got going on. Let me make sure I can do this here. Yep. Like my, let's see, latest book, Facts Over Feelings. It's a great book to help you process your feelings so that you can find the facts behind them so that you can get back to fulfilling your purpose. This book would be a great resource for you. Also, if you're looking for a book to help you process your ability to hold the important things of life, to see whether you're whole enough to hold, this would be a great journal and great resource for you. It's part two of my uh, one of my top selling books, The Purpose of Singleness, this book right here will help you understand the importance of, of, of singleness and how to maximize it. So that'd be a great resource there for those looking for a great resource with their dating partner or or as an individual dating God dating themselves is a great tool here to help you better understand what it means to be dateable to take the love of your life forever. This book has a ton of questions to either end the wrong relationship or extend the right one. If you're looking for a resource to help you process counterfeits versus counterparts to make sure that the guy or girl that's in front of you is the right one for you, here's a great resource here. If you're struggling with soul ties and strongholds, this book, The Purpose of Freedom, will be a great resource. And if you're struggling with spiritual warfare and you want to learn more about how to put on the whole armor of God, here will be a great resource for you. I think we have some comments here. Uh, we got live for him. Thank you for joining. And thank you. God gets to glory. We're excited about our baby coming in. Thank you so much. Jazz says, yo, my guy, what's going on, fam? Uh, PTL says, congratulations. By the way, I appreciate it. Thank you all so much for y'all's constant love and support for me. Uh, Mary, Mary, and let me know how my audio is. Please let me know in the comments if my audio is uh, exceptional. Mary Marie says, hello, what do you think of parents who are forcing their older children to raise their younger siblings? And is it wrong not to want uh, to raise them? Great question. Um... Sometimes uh, with parenting, and, and and who am I to say because I'm not a parent yet, uh, but I, I have been a father figure to some, and I've have of been able to uh, glean from certain conversations and relationships in regards to how children feel uh, with certain parental pressures. Um, but what I would do is is to ensure that before you build resentment or have assumptions, I would take the time to have conversation with them. And ask them, hey, man, this is how I really feel about this. Now, it depends on how old you are. Like, if you have no leverage, then this is what it is. But if you're older and you're 20, 19 and up or whatever, you have a right to voice your opinion. So what I would do is I would just simply just say, hey, mom, I don't feel comfortable with this. I It bothers me uh, with this kind of pressure. Uh, but is it wrong to want not to want to raise them? That's not your responsibility. There's nothing wrong with not feeling uh, like you're supposed to raise. There's nothing wrong with being a big sister or a big brother to them. But I think you should have that conversation uh, with your parents, especially if you're older in regards towards, uh, you know, being an adult. Now, if you're in the house, then 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 you, you kind of got to navigate accordingly. I hope that helps, family. Uh, let's see here. Blessings to you, too, family. Georgia Davis says, what's up, Coach Josh? Is Jojo out of Fort Worth, Texas? How do I go from working a job to putting my focus, investing in business, uh, businesses? My family has such uh, as a clothing line. Great question. Well, the beautiful thing about having a base job is that it gives you the the resources and tools for your dream job, right? And so the thing is not necessarily looking at your job as a hindrance, but as a benefit. Right. So the goal is, is to utilize that consistent pay, utilize that consistent revenue stream to build up that business. So what you would do is, is just kind of process and, and, and discuss with your family. How much money do you bring in? How much money does all those who want to be a part of it bring in and then begin to dissect and see how much money can you reinvest 
into the business as that business grows. You got to look at a business as a baby. Every business is a baby and without food and, and care and love, that business won't grow, right? And so if you want to uh, uh, um, transition, you before you transition, you got to be able to build that clothing line business to such a degree where it's able to fund your family, that it's able to fund and support it. But it's good to have a base job, a job that helps you fund your dream job, right? Um, so, so what you got to do is look at your time. How much time do you spend at work? Uh, so if you work eight hours a day, sleep eight hours a day, 16 hours gone, right? So that leaves you with eight hours left. What do you do with those uh, extra eight hours? See, for me, I hustle. You know, I grind. I, I don't I don't watch the game. Like right now, there's so many games going on right now. What I do with games, I haven't watched a full NBA game in years. And so what do I do is that I go to YouTube and begin to look up different clips just to be abreast of what's going on for conversational purposes with my students. But that's as far as it goes. I spend the rest of my time spending time with God, spending time creatively, and, and just really allowing my environment to bring inspiration. And so you got plenty of extra time to... To, 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 to focus on that dream job as you utilize your main job to fund it. I hope to help. <clears throat> I'll make sure my audio is good. Uh, okay. Sounds good. Okay, great. PTL, my brother says, uh, how can I get to a point to desire God? And I feel like I stay away from the common sins, but I, I but I have a lot of sins like inappropriate joking thoughts, movies I watch, uh, tries to get my attention. Great question. Let me see if you got a part. I think you said something else. You say you're trying your best to explain it, but it feels like I have a, a superficial obedience to God on the outside, but internally I feel a lack, uh, a, a, a lack of submission, if that is a good way of putting it. Great question, man. No problem. So when it comes to, like I was talking to a young lady at work today about um, the benefit of the gospel for the believer. Like many people think the gospel is just for the non-believer, but the gospel has to be replayed often to the believer to, to give them the balance that they need. The gospel message is, is that I am a sinner. Uh, and, and I'm in need of a savior. And there was a savior that came to ensure that I have access to the Godhead so I can be able to be ahead in every area of life for his glory. Right. And so my sins was placed on him and his righteousness was placed on me, which then gives me right standing with God. Now, what does that gospel message does? It keeps you humble, it keeps your heart in the right posture. It keeps your it keeps your mind understanding that you not maybe not a sinner now in regards to classification, but a son now. But as a son, I need sanctification. That the, the, the counter the counterparts of, of salvation is justification. And right now I'm justified as a son of God. But I have to constantly be reminded that I need sanctification. And the word of God says, be holy for I am holy. Um, the Bible says, how can a man cleanse his way? A lot of different scriptures that talks about dying to yourself and 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 really embracing um, this 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 new life with God. So what that does is it requires self examination. It requires uh, a reflection. It, it requires um, intentionality when it comes to personal development, right? And so if you already know that you have these little undercover sins that are not Christ like actions, I mean, or ways, or just put it plain and simple, sins that that, that are not going to help you. To win, but are going to keep you from uh, uh, being the things of God, then now you got to be intentional with it. You got to ask yourself, what is the root reason by which I do this? Uh, and, and for you, since I know your personality, we're very clever. We're, we're very clever. And, and, and with their personality, we also overthink, right? And with that, we have to begin to uh, uh, understand the help that we have because of the gospel, because of Christ, the Holy Spirit that enables us to do what we are enable, uh, uh, incapable of our own doing. So what you do is you just begin not to be sin conscious. I don't want you walking around looking at every time you sin. But every time you do make a mistake, number one, don't feel condemnation or guilt because Christ has given you his righteousness and your sin has been paid for. But second, allow that beautiful transition between the son and ourselves to give you a level of humility and a level of, 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 of reverence and, and appreciation that makes you or bends you into wanting not to bend towards those sins, right? And so what I would do is write a sheet of paper, all the sins that you want to deal with, pray and vent to God to give you revelation on why you do what you do. And then, and then and, and as you go through our life, be, uh, um, uh, conscious of what Jesus did for you 
in regards to what the gospel entails and then live that out and don't beat yourself up about it. Now, the second part you said, I'm trying my best to explain it, but it feels like I, I have a superficial obedience to God. Well, now you have to begin to assess how much of culture, how much of the world are you immersed in? And, and how much of an eternal goal do you have? Um, what's your eternal why? Uh, um, what's your relationship with God like? Now it's time to uh, not coast, but to intentionally invest in your relationship with God. Because obedience on the surface is a reflection of a surface level connection with God. But the more you begin to say, no, I'm going to invest in relationship. Now, listen, if I if my wife is the only one investing in this marriage, will this marriage be uh, 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 unbalanced or balanced? It won't be balanced. I have to intentionally, as a man, invest in my marriage, invest in that relationship, or it will suffer. So every day you got to say, okay, I have to be intentional. And when I find it the hardest to pray, I pray my hardest. When I find it the hardest to read my word, I read my hardest. And, and I and I press through those levels of desire, transitioning into, depend, not dependence, but discipline. I hope they help. <clears throat> Jazz says, my brother says, with your new baby, is there any new approaches you would take on raising your child? Maybe new things you have learned or from experiences from other your other kids. Great question. Um, well, I, I, my, my goal now is to speak life into the child. My, my goal is to make sure the child knows her father's voice uh, or his voice. Uh, my goal is to make sure that this child uh, understands that uh, it is loved, right? And so it starts with the womb. See, my goal is is to make sure that the home that the child is in is is filled with with intentionality, that's filled with love, that is filled with care, right? My goal as a father is to ensure that I care for this child as the child is being developed, to care for this child as my wife is carrying the child, right? And so that's my approach to start from the beginning. Now I am already praying uh, and, and, uh, uh, um, to God to ensure or to, uh, to, to be sensitive um, to, to what all are you packaging, forming in this child at the moment? See, as a parent, I got to make sure that that I am invested and intentional and sensitive to ensure that when the child is born, the home environment from the womb into the house is transitioning to a home where that child can already be gleaming from the colors of his or her wall and the colors uh, uh, and the things that I have in the room to ensure that it continues to trigger inside of the child, things that child was already formed and created to do in the father's womb, right? Now, as 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 far as my mental and, and, and other approaches towards the child when he or she is born is to make sure um, that I position myself where I am positioned to be intentionally in their life. And so what I've learned from a lot of kids is that they didn't feel loved they don't feel they didn't feel loved. And a lot of these kids, symptomatic things that are that are sprouting out right now is a reflection of the rejection that he felt in the womb. So my goal is not to wait till the child is born to show it love, but to show the child love even now so that when it's birthed into the home, they know uh, that that this is my dad. My dad loves me and my dad is intentional with me and my dad set me up for success. Right. So raising my child begins with uh, 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 just ensuring that the word of God is evident, the word of God is played throughout our house, uh, uh, and to make sure that the child is raised, number one, fearing God, understanding God, and as they grow into a certain age where they begin to comprehend the gospel, share the gospel with my child, but also live it out. Because I do believe that there are certain changes that I have to make and, and or implement in a consistent, invisible way by being an introvert. I got to begin to show it more visibly so that when the child is born, the child will begin to say, OK, I see my dad praying. I see my dad in his word. I see my dad serving God. I see, I see, I see. And what he's doing is not contradicting what that child needs. And so my experience for other children is to realize that a lot of these children have pockets of voids in them because their dad was not focused on them. Their parents weren't focused on them. See, right now, this is my last summer. This is it. This is it for me. I have to die greater. I have to die in a greater way. When I married my wife, uh, uh, I died again. Uh, when this child is born, I'm going to die again and constantly die so that my child can live. And no matter what my 
dreams are in regards to ministry, whatever, uh, it comes second to my family. And so those are just some of the random thoughts, because you can almost imagine where I'm at right now in this random pool of process um, as as a child is being born. And when I saw the heartbeat, man, it really shifted my perspective on a lot of things, because that heart is my heart. And I want that heart to have God's heart the same way God has my heart. I mean, that's the ultimate goal I have for this child that God has entrusted me to steward. Thank you for asking that. So you can imagine I'm in the middle of a lot of processing. Kiddo, what's going on? One of my kids there. Oh, uh, let's see. Oh, uh, let's see. Let's see where I'm at. Mm, you're so welcome, Mary. I'm glad. I'm glad I, that answer your question was 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 beneficial. I'm trying to miss this one. Uh, what's up, Co What's up, Andre? Hope you're doing good, fam. All right, so I'm on my phone right now, so I'm trying to navigate this device here. I'm so old school, I'm calling things devices still. Uh, see, I can barely see the questions. All right. Hey, Josh, my name is Nick, and I had a roller coaster of a journey with God. Now, I'm more into seeking wisdom. Does changes in my life on the outside and the inside confirm God is answering and speaking to me? Great question. Let me read it again just for clarity purposes. Hey, Josh, my name is Nick, and I had a roller coaster of a journey with God. Man, who are you telling? Now I'm more into seeking wisdom. Does changes in my life on the outside and inside? Yeah. Uh, see, confirmation is in the development, not necessarily the delivery. See, most people base God's faithfulness to them based upon what he delivers to them versus what he is developing in them. All right. Greater, uh, the greatest confirmation I have in my relationship with God is not the things I hope he delivers or the things that he has delivered, but the things he has delivered out of me, the things that he is de developing in me. Those are the great confirmation that this Josh right now in front of the screen is not the Josh of five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and hopefully not the Josh a year ago. Right. That the constant perspective shifts and the greater depths of patience and the, the greater depths of wisdom, the greater depths of glory of God being manifest through my life just keeps me humble and keeps me in awe that this God who created everything is, is creating such great things inside of me. That's making me creative in my deliveries to ensure that people are set free. And so, yes, man, uh, uh, God's faithfulness is not based upon what is delivered to you. It's based upon what he's delivering out of you and what he's developing in you so that you could be a present when open in delivery to help people become uh, out, uh, freed from slavery, if that makes sense. So that's God speaking to you. And sometimes God don't have to like, does a hug speak? So when I hug someone, does it, does, is there words involved? No, but the hug reveals his love. So there's a lot of things that's happening that may not be vocal, but it's personal in such a way that you know God is in love with you and God is there for you. Hope to help. China says, maybe I should read over here. I asked God for comfort. So I'm over here. So your question over here. So I know your question down there, but your question over here is bigger over here. Okay. China says, I asked God for confirmation on something and he gave me my answer in my disobedience. I didn't walk away because I was afraid. Now I, I was afraid. Now I feel trapped. I'm not sure what to do now. Let me make sure I understand this. I asked God for confirmation on something and he gave me my answer in my disobedience. That's a good point. God does utilize our disobedience and our sin to give us insight of what's going on within, to help us begin to really process who we are, why we do what we do, and et cetera. Um, I didn't walk away because I was afraid, but I feel trapped. I'm not sure what to do. Now, if you're trapped in a relationship or trapped with the individual, now you got to begin to say, okay, I don't want to abuse God's grace. I don't want to abuse God's mercy. And what I mean by grace, I'm not sitting there grace for your salvation. I'm talking about grace for your situation. Um, salvation is different. God's grace is never ending when it comes to that. Like he's always pouring more grace to ensure that you run your race for his glory, right? But when it comes to situations, he's giving you grace. What I mean by the Bible says, shall we continue in sin that grace abounds? The word of God says, God forbid. What that means is, God may look out for you a couple of times. 
because he he understands, hey, maybe the first time you're human, the second time, okay, that's tough to navigate through. But if there's a pride going in your heart or there's a level of neglect in your life, then, then the greatest lesson is going to be the consequence of your sin. So the devil wants you to feel trapped because he makes you feel trapped by believing that God doesn't love you, make you feel that God is not longer with you, that God doesn't care about you. That's all lies. God is saying, come unto me, all you are who are uh, labor, who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, uh, uh, "My take on my yoke, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light, right? And so God is saying, hey, come to me. You're not trapped. You've been set free over 2,000 years ago. You have to trust the freedom that's been given to you by Christ. So number one, you got to say, okay, what am I trapped in? Who am I trapped with? Now, what am I trapped in situationally? Relationship, whatever it is, you begin to say, okay, uh, why, how did I get here? How did I get here? Number two, why am I here? Number three, who am I here with and how significant are they to me? And why are they this significant to me? Number four, who, who do I see God as? Do I see him as a father? Not the father that you may have or didn't have, but do I see him correctly as the heavenly father that he currently is? Right. And then begin to say, OK, thank you, Lord, for your grace, because I don't really have all the consequences that I could have and then and then flee and then run. All right. But you got to process your emotions, process your soul ties. And here's a book that I think would be beneficial to you is the purpose of freedom, how to untie soul ties of Ruth Stronghold. So if you feel like you soul tied to this individual, stronghold to this individual situation, then you got to get this book to help you process what those things are and how to be untied from those different things, right? But but also you got to know that you're loved by God, that God loves you, that with every temptation, he makes a way of escape. Hold his hand. Remember, I think there's a little thing on TikTok or Instagram when uh when they say, when God's saying, hold my hand, hold my, the person said, hold, God's saying, hold my hand, hold my hand. And then all of a sudden, God just pulls you. Let God pull you out of the situation, right? So what you got to do now is process those questions I've given you, really process your soul's connection, and begin to cry out to God and say, God, give me mercy. Not mercy and grace. Yeah, yeah, God, give me mercy. Give me, give me a way out of this. And I promise you, if you pray this prayer tonight, say, God, get me out of this. I want to be in your will. Pray with a sincere heart, and I promise you, the way of escape will be bright tomorrow. The way of escape will be right tomorrow or next couple of 24 to 48 hours. And then then is your choice to walk out of it. I hope that helped. I hope that was uh uh on online of what it is that you was were asking. Ross Scout says, <clears throat> read over here. Hey coach, should I keep this job that I like but doesn't pay the best, or should I look for something better? but I may not like it as much. I'm not sure at this point in time. When you're not sure, uh, when you don't know, don't go. When you don't know, don't go. One thing I learned about God, if I if I ain't heard clear from him, then I'm not going to veer from here. Until I hear from him, I'm not going to veer from here. And that's the monster you got to have. You got to understand that oftentimes you're going to find yourself in situations where um, where uh, there's going to be dips uh, when it comes to finances. And what I mean by that is, is that God sometimes put us situations to prove and to reveal to us that he's our source, right? So if you love, see, when you love what you do, you have greater impact. When you have greater impact, you give and you, and, and, and then there's greater return, there's favor, there's, 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 there's promotional opportunities, right? And, and so you don't look for anything better until God gives you the clearance to do so, right? And so if you love it, do what you love because what you're doing is not necessarily focused on earning. When you're at a job, don't focus on earning, focus on learning. Don't focus on earning because if you focus so much on earning, you'll end up doing something that you don't wanna do just for the earnings. But if you do stuff simply because you love it and you like it and you do it for the learning, you're gonna eventually get to the earning. Right. And so don't allow your heart to get burnt or start or start burning because you're like, man, this is not whatever. Ask God to give you creative ideas, a creative uh, revenue stream. Man, I got 13, 14 revenue streams creatively and I'm creating more because because listen, let me tell you something about an uh, apple tree or orange tree on every apple tree or on every orange tree. There's never been an orange tree where there was one orange, never been an apple where there's one apple. And so inside of you is so much fruit that God may be leveraging, saying, hey, do what you love here, even though it's not paying the best, learn from here, and then utilize what you learn from it to possibly create something on the side that may add some extra money into your pockets. And then you'll be surprised what you develop in life to set you up for financial success. 
So don't allow your heart to be troubled. Blossom where you are. See the benefit where you are. Grow where you are. Steward your money better. Live a little bit more below your means. But as there's not too many jobs out there that people can say they love. And, and you and anytime you love what you do and money is not the goal, you man, money is gonna be a lot that you're gonna behold. Hope to help. I'm so glad it was exactly what you needed, China. I'm so glad. Oh man, okay, okay. Go over here. Audra says, hey coach. I wish to visit my siblings after years of not seeing them, but there's a lot of trauma when it comes to my family life, especially my mom, and I'm getting overwhelmed, anxiety from visiting. Well, listen, let me tell you something about your presence, family. Um, sometimes family don't deserve your presence. Some pe some Sometimes family gets so comfortable with you that they only see you as they see you. Jesus, even when he was in his hometown, wasn't even welcome. He couldn't even do but only a few or a handful of miracles there. Uh, there was a time where there was a little attention between his mother and his brother to the point to where when his mother and brother came and approached him, he said, who's my mother, who's my brother? He said, but those who's in my family. And so maybe right now, you, your God may be trying to develop a new family around you, but all that doesn't mean you neglect your family. That just means you don't um, present yourself as often with your family because your mental health is important. Your emotional health is important. Your spiritual health is important. Your physical health is important. Your holistic health is important. And if, and if it's not important to them and, and they're toxic, then there's no need for you to visit. Now, you can call, you can FaceTime, and, and you got to go at the level that your anxiety can handle until God give, get, teaches you how to handle your anxiety. So go as far as your anxiety can be handled until God teaches you how to handle your anxiety. Simple as that. So if there's a lot of trauma, a lot of drama, then it's going to bring a lot of unnecessary issues in your life. And if mom is toxic and all these people are toxic, then, and that doesn't mean you can go and visit your siblings. Don't have to visit your mom. Like, that's okay. Don't, don't feel, but you owe your family nothing. You don't owe your family anything, especially if they don't, if they, if they don't love you and care for you and understand you and appreciate you. And especially if they make you feel overwhelmed. See, sometimes family utilize their position in your life to get you to be positioned back and closer to where they are. And that's manipulation. That's control, right? So if your siblings are younger, then all you got to do, you owe your mama nothing. Go visit your siblings, pick them up, drop them back off. Go in there and love your mom and see if God has dealt with your mom. And once your mom starts getting toxic and whatever, then you bounce. So, yeah, you don't have to stay with your mom. And then if your mom feels a certain type of way about it, have a conversation with my mom, you're toxic. You, you, you cause me to be anxious. Well, yeah, I don't got time to hear all that. That's your problem. Go deal with God about that. Don't be putting your un, undealt with issues on your children, causing me to be over overweight, weight emotionally. So that's my mindset, man. I, I don't I don't really have a lot of patience for people who don't trust and, and respect my presence. If you don't respect my presence, then there's no need for me to be patient. You know what I'm saying? And so, hope to help. Jay Lamb says, hey, coach, how do I work out and take care of my health without falling into pride, vanity overlooks? Well, you have to understand that you're made in the image of God. Therefore, if you're an image bearer, then you got to be an image carrier. And what I mean by that, you got to care for your image. You got to care about how you look because you got to understand that longevity is the, is the goal. How can I have longevity? Now, to keep you from being um, prideful over your looks is to realize uh, that God wants to use it for his glory. There's nothing wrong with looking nice and liking the way you look, but you have to make sure that you, you, that you have a goal for your health, a goal for your physique, because if your goal for your physique and your health is self-centered, then you, that's, all, that's the only reward you're going to have. But if your goal is to be healthy, whole, then that's going to be something your wife will enjoy or husband will enjoy for those ladies out there, for something for your kids to be able to enjoy because you're going to be able to run with them outside. you got to have a greater goal. And even though you look in the mirror, like, man, you look nice. You'd be like, God, thank you for uh, giving me the discipline um, to, to endure whatever I had to endure to have this physique and to have this body. Keep everything in light of God, and, and that will keep you humble as you get stronger and as you start beginning to look good. But you have to understand the consequences of being self-centered and focused on your body doesn't end well, family, and doesn't end well for your family as well. Jazz says, someone stole my motorcycle last week 
And I kind of got the guy on video. I filed my report to the cops. What should I do if I see that guy around? I honestly want to put hands. Don't put hands on. The Bible says, vengeance is mine. I already pay, say the Lord. Vengeance is mine. So what you do is if you see him, you know, uh, um, guys, what I would do now, just say, you know what, God, angels, you know where my, you know where my stuff is. Lord, I believe you're going to bring it back to me. And Lord, if you don't want me to have that, I know you're going to bring something greater than me. And then when you see that person, don't, don't just, 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 just keep walking, mind your own business because God's taking care of me. You don't know what the delay is doing. You don't know what the delay is doing. There's a lot of things in the delay that God is, that God is utilizing. Uh, uh, and so all you got to do is rest knowing that God's going to bring back that bike or God's going to give you something better. So don't put hands on it because then you're going to put yourself in a bad situation. Um, but that's the beautiful thing about being a believer is that God's got you, that that God's going to make sure that no matter what has been stung with the canker worm or the whatever it has eaten, he'll restore it to you. And so just rest tonight, rest every night, knowing that God's going to bring everything back in his time and it's going to be better. And, and there's he's doing something in the delay. So trust him in that. You're so welcome, my brother. Kizzy Lolo, what's going on? Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Lord. Uh, not Lord. <laughs> you know, you've been talking to God so many. You've been saying thank you, Lord, all the time. You be thank you, Lord, mostly. I say I say thank you, Lord, man, more than I say thank you to people. So my apologies to Thank you so much. I've been going 31 minutes. So let me get off in about 10 minutes. So Jess says, do you think when two individuals have a kid out of lust, it will affect the kid? Yeah, it's going to affect the kid, but it doesn't have to affect the kid if you repent from it. And what I mean for, I mean, a, a kid naturally wants a home where both the mother and father is. But as long as the individuals or one individual uh, um, is willing to uh, show that child God, and and be that godly uh father or mother to the child it's it's going to it's going to help that child nothing that happens in sin can't be turned around for it to win there, so it don't matter what happens in sin if the sinner or the person who committed the sin repents and renounce and allows their mind to be renewed and 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 allow the imputed righteousness of them to inspire to live righteously it's going to have a resounding effect on the child Will that kid automatically not feel loved in life because it wasn't made out of pure love? No. However a kid gets here, it's up to the parents to steward that child. People think the most functional home is where there's a mother and a father. The most functional home is the home where even if it's one mother, one dad is wherever God is a Lord of. That's what's the best home. I didn't have my dad in my life. Oh, I had him in my life. I didn't have him in my home. Right? But God was in my home and, and I turned out all right. My wife turned out all right in her situation. So uh, so what I'm saying is that there are some things that you have to make sure not to feel condemned by or to make you feel like you're not a great father or to make you feel like you're not uh, able to really be who you need to be. It just says, OK, I know what I've done. God has redeemed me from that. Now I am a, I, I've always been as far as since my salvation that I'm a son of God and God's going to teach me and show me that in this particular situation, how to be the person I need to be despite how this person was birthed out of. As long as a kid feels loved and a kid is, is cared for and a kid is made to understand as they grow up the things of God, who they are, uh, 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 creating an environment, whether it's in two different homes, wherever, where that child understands that there's love and chemistry between the two, even there's no love and chemistry between the two parents, but they're endeavoring to work it out. Yeah, as long as you, as long as you do your part as a father, bro, you'll be surprised. But as the child gets older, there will be it will it will be as if there was nothing uh, uh, um, detrimental that occurred for that child to be whatever. It's when a child is here and parents disappear that causes the child to be grown up in fear and and affected by their peers and never be able to do uh, what God wants them to do. So whether it's through lust or love, as long as when they come out, you love them, the, the child will be all right. Dominique says, hey, coach, do you think we should wait on God to give us a vision of what he wants us to do? Or should we just go for it? Great question. All these are great, but I get, I get this question a lot. I don't want to be out of alignment, but also I'm scared to take a risk. Great question. One thing that I've learned in my walk with God is that the closer you get to him, uh, let me give this analogy. When I play ball with people that I've played ball with a lot, you 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 know their spots. 
they know they know when I catch the ball in the high post, they catch the ball in the low post, or I catch the ball in the side, uh, uh, mid mid uh, mid range on the side. Uh, people who know my game, they'll cut. They know I'm a great passer. Uh, Jokic with my passing, and they know. Okay, when 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 as he sets a screen, or when Josh sets a screen, he they know by my body language if I'm going to pick and fade or pick and pop. Now I know you may be a lady, you may understand this. So what I'm trying to say is that wherever there's chemistry, there's some level of uh, of of intimacy, knowing where the person's supposed to be, right? And so with walking with God, when you felt me, you will in real time know unctions, in real time know what he wants you to do, right? And how to take risk. And I don't think God wants us to be independent or dependent, super independent, super dependent. He wants us interdependent. Interdependence means that there's some things I can do without, without, there's some things that I have the liberties to do and some things I don't have liberties to do. So as long as you begin to really embrace your dependence on God and embrace God's love for you, then you will be free to do certain things. And then you'll know about time you make that one step, you'll know if there's a clearance or there's a hindrance. Big difference. So when you're walking with God, you will feel that tug. You will feel that clearance, like when I, uh, clearance to go do or that hindrance not to do. It's all about rhythm. It's all about chemistry. It's all about relationship. It's all about fellowship. And the more you do that and invest in that, the greater it is in the real time play by play. I mean, there's a lot of things that I do now that like I have the unction to get out from my desk to walk down the hall. Or it's just that that closeness with God where I'm able to sense, hey, get up and go here. Do this and do that. Or if I'm going in a certain direction, oh, don't talk to that person right now. Uh, it's just it's all about that chemistry, that flow. And you can't have that chemistry of flow if you don't spend time, time to know him, to know his unctions, to know his voice, to know what he wants you to do, not to do. It all comes from time. The more you invest time, the better you will execute with him. So there are some things, major things that you shouldn't take risk on. You shouldn't take risk on a relationship. You shouldn't take a, what I mean by risk, until you have a vision. You have to have a clear confirmation about God when it comes to relationships, clear confirmation from God when it comes to moving, clear conference, clear confirmation from God when it comes to um, um, dealings with money and business and partnerships. You need that confirmation, right? But when it comes to grocery stores, talking to people, whatever, whatever, day-to-day -day stuff, coworkers, decisions on the job, all that kind of stuff, you don't have time to wait for a vision. Some things require immediate immediate attention. And that and and the the more you invest in time with God now makes those situations easier. Hear me? It makes those situations easier. So that's why I spend so much time with God. That's why I don't watch too much TV. That's why I stay sensitive because it makes those tough situations easier. That's why my wife can tell you right now, the number one reason why she uh, loves me is because I am five for five from major decisions. Now, when it comes to little stuff, I'm really good. But when it comes to like only God can tell you what to do, I'm five for five. Now she's like, hey, man, whatever God tells you, I trust it because this man has evidence that he is five for five. But I sound a lot, but they're big things, right? That she saw like, wow. So what I'm saying is, but that those decisions were made because of my devotion and, and my develop, developing investments in God. So don't be scared because fear has torment. So that's nothing wrong with taking risk creatively, taking risk, whatever. But I'm telling you, your relationship will help risk taking be better. Hope to help. Man, I got more questions coming in. Okay, let me get through these real quick. I'm going to do a little rapid fire so I can get everybody's question. Andre Ho says, hey, coach, is it a problem dating more than one person? Yeah, it is a problem because it causes confusion, especially if you're a gentleman especially if you're a man, um, you never want to have too many people involved in your plan as a man. You want to be very specific, very intentional, and you want God's plan for your life, right? So it's very problematic dating more than one person at a time because it's t when you got two people, it's taking up double the time, and now you're causing double the, the desire, and now you got two people that want you. And then it makes the decision even harder because when it comes to cutting one off for the other, then 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 now that person is left with some level of wound, some level of tie, some level of, uh, of, of whatever that may be, whatever. And one thing that I learned as a young man that really uh, 
I, I advise all young men is to make sure you respect the hearts of a woman, the time of a woman, the mind of a woman, the body of a woman, respect it. If you know that you're not ready to inspect it, then, then and you're not ready to be uh, the person to protect it, then, then don't interject it. Like don't, don't try to uh, uh, connect with her. Because when a woman, a woman is a nurturer, a woman is a multiplier, and, and a woman wants to be, a, a, to a degree, if she's a daughter of God or just any woman, I think, to a degree, desires to be a helpmate. And, and you don't want to lock in her emotions and her attention and her feelings if you're trying to figure. Never mess with a woman's feelings if you're trying to figure things out. You have, in order to pursue women, you got to have it already figured out. So this is the one I want. This is the one I'm cleared by God to pursue because her feelings, her thoughts, her emotions, her everything are going to be affected. So it's very problematic to date around. You're supposed to be uh, um, learning how to date God and date yourself. Because when you date God, when I mean by dating God, I'm not talking about taking God out to Starbucks. I'm talking about taking, take, establishing dates and hours within certain days to spend time with him and set dates for yourself. Go out, date yourself by going to the gym, by going in to Whole Foods or Trader Joe's, eating healthier earth fair. Take yourself out on dates to for mental health, emotional health, physical health, spiritual health. When you date God and date yourself, now you become dateable. Because when you begin to date the love of your life forever, you will be dateable to the point to where that person can truly enjoy you any time, any day, any date of the month, right? And then when it comes to core team, then you'll be able to intentionally date this one individual with the intentions of getting married. And it saves you time. It saves you headache on the back end. And it saves you from feeling uh, your, your consciousness scarred because you scarred a woman's heart. Very problematic, my brother. I would just let them both go until you know from God who you're supposed to pursue. Thank, uh, thank you. It was exactly what I needed. God gets the glory. Thank you, Josh. Last part really touched. God gets the glory. I'm glad. I better hurry up. What what time is? I can't even see the time. I don't even know what time it is. My wife's gonna be like, bro, what is you doing? This right here is very good. I just got back from the gym. This shine drink for hydration is perfect, man. Can someone let me know what, what time is the Eastern Standard Time? <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, I'm gonna let someone let me know what time is the Eastern Standard. Excuse <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> me. <clears throat> Jacob, <clears throat> hold on. <clears throat> that thing had a little antioxidants. One of them antioxidants grabbed my throat. And it was like, hey, let me see what time it is. He's standing. 10.58. Ooh, I'm in trouble, bro. She's asleep right now, but I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Sounds like I had Jacob's question. Now, this is probably my last one. Uh, Happy spouse, happy house. You see what I'm saying? Nah, she's giving me liberty to do this, but I still want to be make sure that she, you know, She's at peace and at rest, man. We got babies and stuff. Hey, coach, they say the desires of the flesh can be combated using the fruits of the spirit. So how does one develop the fruit of the spirit? Like just reading the Bible and praying. Great question. I talked to a young lady today about the fruit of the spirit. And we talked about the gifts of the spirit is always greater. The fruits of the spirit is always greater desired than our gifts of the spirit. Because a lot of people can prophesy, but without love. Uh, you, you're nothing. Um, you can have all these different gifts, prophesy, interpret tongues, and and have gifts of faith and all that kind of stuff. But if you don't have the fruit, if you don't have love, you're nothing, right? So uh, let's look at your question again. They say the desires of the flesh can be combated using the fruits of the spirit, right? The desires of the flesh and the fruits. The Bible says, "Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. For if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of that, and the pride of life. And these things are not of God." Now. The fruits of the spirit is developed from fellowshipping with the spirit. Fruits of the spirit are developed from fellowshipping with the spirit. And, but, but like I say, you cannot 
you cannot outwork a bad diet. You can you can never outwork out a bad diet. So what I mean is, you can you can you can do all the things that you want to do, fellowship with God, fellowship with God, read your Bible and pray. But if you have a poor spiritual diet, if you have a poor emotional diet, if you have a poor mental diet, no matter what you do beside it, it ain't gonna it ain't gonna be a benefit to you. So you gotta look at yourself holistically. What do I watch? What do I listen to? Who are my friends? Who are in my community? What am I? What are my voids? What are the hurts? What are the wounds in my life that is going to hinder the fruits of the spirit going through? The Bible talks about when the word of God is planted <clears throat> or sown, some seed fall on hard ground and immediately birds come up and eat it. Meaning that when, when it's in the heart, it's hard. It's not saved. It's not having been cultivated by the Holy Spirit. Demons will try to remove it so there won't be no hope for salvation for that person. The Bible then talks about that there's some people who have stones in their heart and that with the seed of, with seed of the word of God is planted, they receive it immediately with joy because they have some soil, but the rocks keep the fruit from developing and then it proves unfruitful over time. The Bible also talks about that there are some people that got uh, uh, thorns in their heart and it chokes the word and proves unfruitful fruitful. And so what that thing is saying is that there are some things in the heart that has to be cultivated, that has to be developed, that has to be nurtured, that has to be matured in order for those things to, to maturate and to uh, uh, grow and to be manifest. So for me, how can I walk in love if I have a porn addiction? How can I walk in joy if, if money makes me happy? How can I walk in peace when I'm problematic? How can I be long suffering when, when everything bothers me, right? Or what my dad or mom did bothers me or the reason why I'm impatient is these kind of reasons. So what I'm saying is you got to begin a lot of Holy Spirit to show you inside of your heart why these things are not a part of your life spiritually. So you just can't, you can't just simply utilize, okay, let me go to the grocery store and get these fruits of the spirit and then splash them and make a smoothie, a concoction to fight the toxicity and the, and the, the, uh, the issues of my soul. It starts with the fellowship of the Holy Spirit so that he can reveal the holes in your soul and then ask you the liberty, liberty for him to come in, patch those areas up so it can be a smooth stream. The Bible talks about that any branch is not of me, he prunes it. Not of not of me, but he says if a branch that there's some there's branch that he prunes so they can bear more fruit. So you gotta allow him to prune you. That's what hardship is. That's what uh going through tough times is. That's what <clears throat> um um the devil not the devil but God ch chasing you pruning you so that you can bear more fruit because the God wants the branch and the vine to be aligned. Now what does that mean? The branch is you. You're the branch. And there are certain bent, bents and dents and, and twists that's keeping the vine from flowing smoothly, like a smooth highway. So ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what are the things inside of you that's hindering you from being the person you need to be so the fruit of the Spirit can flow. The fruit of the Spirit really comes as greater depths the deeper you go through sanctification. Sanctification is the pruning process by which the Holy Spirit cleans all the voids of your past, the, the hurts and wounds of your past, the bad habits of your present, so that when you are presented as a present, you have a smooth and clear gift to offer people in greater depths. But you won't be able to know what love is until you know God's love for you. You won't be able to know what true joy is until you begin to see that God is the only place for your joy to be sustained. You won't be able to walk in greater peace until you know the prince of peace and understand um the things that's causing you to be anxious and and see i grew in greater peace when i began um to overcome anxiety so the fruit of spirit of of peace wasn't ever in my life seven eight years ago anxiety gripped my soul but i had to look at what my anchor was my anchor was my ministry the anchor was my money but it wasn't the master and when I made him my anchor and I made him my everything, then peace came. I wasn't so impatient anymore. So it's all about looking at what I would do is look at. I want you to write down all the fruits of the spirit. And I want you to write scale to one to ten. How strong is this evident in your life? Any any fruit of spirit that's under a six or a seven. I want you to ask heaven. Why there's leaven or where's the leaven? Right. What that will do is you'll begin to say, okay, in what areas am I sprouting? Because there could be something in my branch, in my alignment that's keeping peace from thriving. Love may be thriving, but peace is not. Why is peace not? Why self-control is not? Why is gentleness not? 
And then you have to look inside of your soul and ask yourself, oh, okay, I see why I'm impatient. It's because I forgot, I haven't I haven't forgiven my dad, I haven't forgiven my mom. Oh, I see why I lack self-control because I lack systems in my life. And the Holy Spirit will begin to see why are certain areas out of alignment. Some areas just requires maturity. Some areas require maturity for you to go through certain trials. The Bible says, count it all joy. How can you count it all joy if you don't know the purpose of a trial? So when, as you get older, you begin to say, oh, that's what a trial is. Then you will be more susceptible of counting it all joy because you know that your faith must be tested so that you can be. So now these scriptures will become more alive and more real for you to make better deals. So how does one develop the fruits of the spirit? Fellowship with the spirit. You can't have fruit without the root. And if he ain't the root, you ain't going to bear fruit. So, yes, reading and praying are essential, but self-reflection and allowing the Bible to read you and allowing God to fellowship with God in prayer and really being disciplined would ensure that those fruits be manifested in your life. I love you. I got to go. Oh, yes, dummy. Just, I, I'm going to get to everyone this summer. I got about two and a half weeks of school left. And so uh, I'll I'll be I'll be getting that coaching ready. Um, TJ Dream says, "Why is it that every girl I've ever liked in life only see me as a friend or don't find me attractive at all, but the girls I don't like find me attractive?" Who knows, my brother? Well, it's, the thing is, you only have to worry about being attractive to the one that God has for you. And what I would do is, I see one thing about me, man, <clears throat> or I can't say that right now because I'm married, but anything that I'm, that I'm attractive to, like success or whatever, I'm not pressed. I'm not pressed because I know God has his best. And so what I will do is, is that don't worry about, I wouldn't worry about liking a girl right now. I wouldn't even worry. I will, I will, I will start loving God, letting God love me and loving and liking myself. Because I'm telling you, I've, I've never met, they say you never met an ugly broke, a ugly rich person. <laughs> you never met an ugly successful man. That's what they say, right? And so women don't go by looks all the time. They go by, some women go by looks, but a, a lot of like vision driven women, they go by how do you look in regards to provision. And so the more you elevate yourself, the more you begin to develop yourself with humility, the more attractive you become. And then you will meet the level of attraction needed to attract the one God has for you. And you go off from that. And, and that's just life, man. Not everybody's going to be attractive. And that's it. Like, not, I'm not the most attractive guy in the world, but I only have to be attracted to one girl. And that's it. Feels like God doesn't want me to have my desire. Now, now that's where you got to look at your heart. Just because something is not operating in accordance of your desire doesn't mean that God is going to give desire your heart. The Bible says, they that delight themselves in the Lord, he will give them desires at heart. What does that mean? The more you go to the the more you go to the light and God becomes your delight, the thing that you joy and want the most, then your desires become his desires. The enemy wants you to dwell in feelings as if God doesn't want to give you what you want. Just because these girls turned you down, now all of a sudden God turns you down. God uh, 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 hurts you. And all of a sudden now you're getting upset. What I'm saying you are. But now now people get upset with God. What well, has that to do with God? They're, so that's basically manipulative behavior. Not necessarily from you, but some people do that manipulatively as if they can make God give them what they want. And God said, I'm not budge. I don't budge based upon manipulative behavior. I don't budge just because you don't see what's, what's coming from above. God says, my timing is perfect. My timing is perfect. And just because things are not working out perfectly for you, die to you, is what he's saying. The more you die to you, the more you'll see what God wants to live through you to do. So we got to look at the fields. You got to get out of the fields and look at the facts. The facts is God has someone out there for you. That's factual. But you have to, before you can latch, you have to match. And so instead of getting caught up on why these girls don't like me, you got to ask yourself, why don't I like me? Why don't I love me? Because if you love and like yourself, it doesn't matter who. Let me tell you something about me. I'm a very confident guy. And, and, and it, I don't care who wants to be my friend, who don't want to be. I don't care who likes me or don't like me. I don't care because I care about me because God cares for me. So you got to ask yourself, why do I like myself enough? 
Because when you know God's love for you and you begin to understand that God has what's best for you, then you'll trust God's timing. It don't mean you won't have tough moments. But when those tough moments come, you know for a fact that God has what's best for you. You won't get so caught up in your feelings. So never say that phrase. It feels like God doesn't want me to have. Your, your desires are wrong. Just if God is not meeting your desires and your desires are wrong or your desires are out of place, because if you desire the girl more than you desire God, because your anger towards God, or people's upsetness towards God reveals idolatry or reveals insecurities. It reveals deeper, darker things inside you that, that proves why God hasn't brought anything to you in that regard. So I hope that helped, brother. Now, I know that was a little strong tone, but hear my heart, though. you so welcome, fam. Love you, man. That's what I'm here for. Thank you, Harriet. Congratulations on your baby. I pray your children inherit the fruit. Amen. God gets the glory. I know, man. I was mad skinny, bro. That was, man, that was 13, 14 years ago, man. That I made those videos in one of the toughest times of my life. I lost so much weight, man, but God told me to keep doing those videos, man. So now I'm at a, I'm trying to lose weight. <laughs> Uh, thanks for your time and all you do. You're so welcome. Uh, I'm just trying to see questions I can answer real quickly. What what time is it now? No, it's 10. I got to go, y'all. I got to be respect. I got to get out of here. What drink is that? It's called Shine. Shine. Um, you can get it, uh, I think, at Quick Trip. You can get them at um, Food Line if you're in the South or North Carolina, at least. Um, yeah. All right, y'all. I've been on here for a while. Got to go, y'all. Love y'all. I pray y'all was blessed by this. Make sure you check out some resources. Those who want to support what I do, and you're like, hey, man, this, this message was a blessing to me. I want to give the support. You can do that here. I am unplugged.com. Your uh, support helps us do a lot of different things. Uh, also, if you want to check out my latest book, Facts with Fillers, How to Go from Filling to Fulfilling. And to find the facts behind this book is a great resource, man. It's going to help you really process your feelings to get back to feeling your purpose. If you need a book to help you process how you're holding your spouse, how you're holding your responsibility, how you're holding your children, how you're holding yourself. Uh, this book, The Holdings Journal, will help you process your hold and see if you're able to hold the things that you want and to assess how you hold the things you currently have. If you want to better understand the purpose of your singleness and you want to learn how to maximize your singleness, this book would be a great resource for you. If you're looking for a book for you to go through by yourself to learn how to date God and date yourself or to be able to go through this book with someone else to see where they are, to see if you're on the same page, this book, Dating Prep, would be a great book. It has questions to either help you end the wrong relationship or extend the right relationship. This book right here, Counterfeit or Counterpart, is a great book, a great resource for you to be able to learn how to discern the will of God for your life and to be able to follow God's yes and trust God's no. Great book there. If you're looking for a book to help you untie soul ties, uproot strongholds, there's a great book right here to help you do that. If you're looking for a children's book to help kids discover their art from, here's my wife and I's cartoon characters. It's a great book for them. And if you're looking for a book to help you with spiritual warfare and to help you put on the whole armor of God and what each armor represents and does, here's a great resource here. So thank you all so much for trusting me with your questions this evening. I pray y'all was blessed by it. Thank y'all so much, man. And I love you all. Let me see if I can find my graphic. And I'll see y'all next time. Peace.